Why does the world not want faith in Jesus? Salvation from eternal death doesn't come any other way. Our world is pretty self-centered. Either people don't think they're going to die someday, or they fool themselves into thinking that God will let everyone into heaven. We can show the world what faith will do in this life, not just in the afterlife. It was faith that healed cripples and blind, and so much more. Since Jesus is the light of the world, it makes sense that we light a candle for hope. We light this second candle as a sign of faith that Jesus gave us and gives others to us. Let us pray, dear Lord, give us hope in overcoming this world and increase the faith you have already placed in our hearts. May the faith you give us be light for our spirit to always follow and bring others to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson begins in the book of Isaiah. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice for the shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And from the New Testament, the second letter of St. Peter, in the third chapter. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not now keeping his promise. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, but not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Hear the word of the Lord from the gospel according to St. Mark. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins. 
They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When I was in seminary, I was a student pastor under a senior pastor in Galleon at the First United Methodist Church. My functions were, one, start a singles group, which I found the singles didn't want as much as the church did. <clears throat> and to take care of the junior high, UMYF. Now, I had just come from being a, a, a teacher a while back, and my best success was junior high. So I figured, okay, we can go to work. They, part of my time with them every night was a devotional, and I tried to teach them things like um, the importance of recycling, and we did a paper drive once, and just try to teach some basic stuff, and then, of course, my philosophy is you got to do something fun or you're not going to keep them, so we'd always play a game. <clears throat> And among some of the things we did, we took a tr bike trip out to the park and had lunch out there. I went to Cedar Point at the end of the year. But one of the things that we would do is we'd play a game, a game every time. And they wanted to teach me hide-and-seek galleon style. <laughs> they used the entire neighborhood. And they said, up to this street, this street, this street, and that street. I said, okay, we can try this. And I'm, here I'm thinking liability in cars and crossing streets. And, but they had a blast doing it. So the following week, I taught them reverse hide-and-seek. Anybody ever hear of this? You know, normally, the one person who is it is the one that has to go looking. In reverse hide-and-seek, the it gets to go hide. Everybody else has to go look for them. And we use the church building. Now the catch is, when you find it, you have to hide there with them. So you get a small enough space, and after about three or four kids, they're going to be standing out where you can see them. And they had a blast doing that. We ought to do that sometime. Just get us adults to play hide and seek out in the, the, in the neighborhood. Yeah. <coughs> Wouldn't that get some eye, eyebrows raised? <coughs> but I got to thinking about the way people treat faith. You know, Jesus told people who were healed or Jairus' daughter that was raised from death, uh, don't tell anybody. It's like it's a secret. I want to hide this. And the reason is because they go telling everybody, and then everyone in under creation would bring their sick people to him, and then he wouldn't be able to preach, right? So that's, that's why that happened. So it's like Jesus was it, and it seemed like he didn't want anyone to tell about the healing. And now Jesus is it, but we're supposed to tell, and bring them to hide with Jesus. You think, well, hide. Why would we want to hide? There's coming a time when Christianity in this country is going to be persecuted. I mean, it's already to a point where you are not allowed to mention Jesus' name in your workplace. Give them 20 more years, they're going to take away our tax exemption status. They're going to start persecuting the church if we're still around in 20 years. Persecution is not fun. And so Christians, like the first century, will have to hide when we gather to worship. And then 
we'll have to seek out people that are looking for God and bring them with us. It's kind of like that reverse hide and seek bit. <clears throat> and this has been cyclical. It happens time and time again through history. It's kind of like you got a big scratch on an LP. And every time that goes around, the needle goes click. We all remember records? Okay, I, I just want to make sure. We haven't forgotten them. I still play mine, by the way. But in Isaiah's time, he's dealing with Jerusalem that had been besieged. Now here's a little history lesson. The two kingdoms, uh, Judah in the south was not on the direct trade route, but Israel and the northern ten tribes were on the trade routes, and they had all kinds of foreign influence coming through there. And they just became a worldly <coughs> faith. And the southern two tribes in Judah said, uh-uh, <coughs> you know, we're not going to deal with you. And so when Assyria came to power and they came and destroyed the northern ten tribes, and they asked for Judah to help, and they said, no, we're not going to. And they were defeated by Assyria. Assyria came down to the southern kingdom and surrounded Jerusalem, besieged Jerusalem, but got a message to come back home because Babylon rose to power and attacked Syria. So Assyria drew their troops back to fight Babylon. Babylon eventually won. And then came and finished Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. But Isaiah is talking to Jerusalem as the Assyrian troops are walking away. <clears throat> Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. She has paid twice the price for her disobedience. You think that would bring people to God, right? Like 9-11, how many people came back to church that haven't been there for a long time? Where are they now? Same thing happened in Israel. Yeah, Jerusalem repented for a while and went back to doing what they were doing. And God sent Babylon to finish the job. But Isaiah is talking in the in-between time. You've paid your price. Come back to God, repent. They did, but they went back to the way they were doing things before. Kind of sounds like America. Before 9-11, we were a lot like we are now. 9-11 happened, we're attacked. People come to church. People flew the American flag. And now where are we? Back to the way we used to be. Why don't people remember is probably because they don't get hooked into Christ in the Holy Spirit in the first place. They come and church makes them feel good, but they don't get a relationship built with Christ. That's why we come. Every week we humble our spirits before God. At least I hope we are. Every week we should listen for God's voice. Maybe it's something in one of the hymns that speaks to you. That's God whispering to your spirit. Maybe something in the scriptures you never heard before. And God pointed that out to you. And you were paying attention. Maybe it's a challenge that I give you. It's, it's not me. It's what you do with it is the Holy Spirit talking to you. And that's why we come, so we can hear the Spirit of God talking. You see, after the Babylonians, the Greeks came in. Then after a couple hundred years of that, Judas Maccabeus rose up and threw, raised up an army and drove the Greeks out. And after that, 400 years later, the Romans came in. Remember, 400 years, they hadn't heard a prophecy or anything. So when Jesus appears, that's the first time God has talked to them in 400 years. 
That's important to remember for Christmas Eve. So sock that away in your memory. <clears throat> but what Isaiah did was he drew people's attention back to God. He said, you saw what just happened out there. God punished you twice as much as you really needed to be to get your attention. And the people repented, and Jerusalem started worshiping God again. And then they forgot. Now, in, in John's time, in Jesus and John's time, as I said, it had been 400 years. And all of a sudden, John appears preaching in the wilderness, repent, turn back to God. Make a straight path for him. Smooth it out. Make, it un make the uneven places smooth. Bring down the mountains. Raise up the valleys. God is coming. It's basically what he's telling them. And then poof, Jesus is there. So what Isaiah saw in the future, he had to tell them. Repent. God is coming. And John was very attuned to Isaiah, especially the part where God was convicting him that this was what he was supposed to do. John was the one that was the messenger beforehand, and yet he stayed humble. Boy, is that a key to all of us, to stay humble. I'm not worthy to even to untie his sandals so I can cool his feet from the day's heat. He knew his position, and it was his cousin. How many of us, had, if we had a cousin that started acting that way, would be humble enough? Or would we say, boy, I remember when you threw up all over the dog, you know? We'd find us some way to be cute with our cousin, but not John. He knew his position. And he called people to repentance, to come back to God. See, in Israel, there were four political groups. The Sadducees, who basically ran the temple, did not believe in an afterlife. Can you believe that? Their thoughts were that, if I obey these laws, God will repay me and I'll get rich and I'll have a luxurious lifestyle. Sounds like 21st century America, doesn't it? There were the Pharisees who believed in an afterlife, but if you didn't do these laws exactly the way they are, you're not going to get there. That's the Pharisees. A third group was the Essenes. And their belief was, this world is so corrupt, we're going to pull out and we're going to go by ourselves. We're going to study scriptures. We're going to copy them. We're going to pray. We're going to seek God all the time. Sounds like the monastic movements, doesn't it? And then there were the Zealots. These are the ones who would... If you, were stand, if you were a zealot and you were standing behind a tax collector and there wasn't anybody around, you'd slit his throat. They wanted Rome out of there so bad, they had just like a kid before Christmas. These are the four parties in Israel. Most people were not a part of any one of them. The four parties basically were seen as leaders of their community. Did you want to get close to God? You might want to go over to Qumran where there's some caves. There's a bunch of people down there praying and copying scriptures. If you want to be a power monger, get in the Sadducees. If you want to be holier than now, be a Pharisee. If you want Rome out of here, be a zealot. What's interesting is you had a tax collector, Matthew, and Simon the zealot were both disciples of Jesus. Now, if I was Matthew, I'd be kind of worried with that zealot being in the party, in the group. Because Simon probably, if they weren't disciples and around Jesus, probably would have killed Matthew. 
But Jesus had a way of bringing peace to them all, bringing them in, and loving them all. Because this is what John foretold. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He's coming. How many of us treat Christmas as he's coming? Do you get excited when you think about Jesus coming back? Or it's kind of like you just broke mama's favorite plate and you hear footsteps coming down the steps. Uh oh. I hope nobody here feels that way about Jesus coming back. We're people of faith, we're the ones reaching out to God. He's coming back. To bring us home. So eventually, as bad as the world is getting, we're going to want to bring people who are looking for God in here to hide from the animosity of the world. Because the world hates Christians. If you have anything traditional in your mind, liberals are going to attack it. Every once in a while, I'll post something, and all the liberals come out of that woodwork. I unfriend folks that are going to do that. But I pray for them first, and I give them a shot, and we talk a little bit back and forth, and they tell me how stupid I am, and I think, I know you're the dumb one because you've forgotten God in the process. You're so hepped up on yourself. And your agenda. Reverse hide and seek works for faith, especially now in the 21st century. We need to bring people here that are listening for God. You can figure out who they are in conversation. If you let the conversation go long enough, you'll find out where they are. The problem is, how many of us talk to strangers throughout the week anybody or do we know all of our neighbors and we know their positions on things that's something we might consider this Christmas is to get to know somebody that's not in your current circle of friends I, I know we get busy we really do as part of life but along the way God may have someone cross your path that needs to hear the love of Christ. And all they need to do is repent. Not that they're all bad, but they just need to turn around and face Jesus. They could be facing anywhere else. They just need to turn and face Jesus. Because that's the whole point of faith. Salvation, you've got to realize, one, we're sinners, all of us. We're separated from God. We're not in his presence. We can't see him. Sinners got a problem when judgment happens, but we confess our sins to God. We say, God, I'm sorry forever have them looked away. And then you ask God to forgive. And then you ask God to help you overcome. Sometimes I think we forget the last part. We got to ask God to help us overcome. Now, I don't care about anybody's as the sinners out there. I don't care what the sin is. They've got a soul that God created. And he, Isaiah said, God doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want anybody to go down there. God wants to save everybody. God wants us to be his mouthpiece. To tell people of the love God has for them. Sometimes I think we tell ourselves God loves us. Maybe not often enough if you're feeling like you still need more of that. But we also need to tell the world God loves them. Doesn't want them to perish. So there are people who make a hero out of the Grinch. You got to pray for them. Yeah, the Grinch does turn and return all the who's 
the toys. That's what we're hoping that we will do with the world. Turn all them Grinches out there into good Grinches. It may seem funny to think of hide and seek, but I think we've been hiding in the church far too long. We need to seek the ones out there that are listening for God's voice. There are people out there like that. Isaiah and John both bring out the point, repent, just turn to God. God is coming. Now we can say he came and he's coming back. Do you get goosebumps when you say that? I hope so. Because that means you're connected. I get excited when I think about Jesus coming back because I want to be in his presence forever. And I want you guys to be with me. Don't disappoint me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Most holy God, we give you thanks for Isaiah and the wonderful message that he brought that we need to turn to you. We give you thanks for John who came with that same message to turn to God. We thank you for sending yourself in Christ. You came. You taught. You healed. You raised the dead. You, you gave the good news, the message of God's love. Keep that in our hearts and may we always cherish that. And we pray, Lord, that you will use us as your mouthpiece today and this week. Let someone that, whose Holy Spirit has been bugging to cross our paths so that they might be able to listen and hear your loving message in us. Help us accept people and help them to turn from their sins. Not because we're perfect, because we're sinners too. Remind us to be listening for your voice, always. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. <coughs> Our closing hymn is Sing We Now of Christmas. That is not the right number. 237. For those that are using the music... If not, the words are right up there. <clears throat> sing we now of Christmas, no well sing we here. Hear our grateful praises to the babe so dear. Sing flocks at rest journey forth to Bethlehem find the child so blessed sing we know well the king is born no well sing we now of Christmas sing we now know well in Bethlehem they found him Joseph and Mary mild seated by the man child sing we know how the king is born no well sing we now of christmas sing 
us a joke for the week is, as a guy walked into a, an establishment and saw a nativity set and the three wise men were dressed in firefighters' outfits. And he asked him why. He said, well, it says in the Bible that the three wise men came from afar. <laughs> in that light, take the love and faith and hope that we have in Christ Jesus out into the world. We've been blessed. Let's bless the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.